Good morning and welcome to AP Statistics for Wednesday, May the 6th. Today we're going to review prompts numbers 3 and 4 from the 2018 FRQ section. Uh, number 3 started off by talking about uh, single births versus multiple births and the proportion of people who are left-handed from both of those sets. So I'm actually just going to start off by making a little tree diagram to help keep things organized. All right, so people are born and they're either singles, like most of us, or they're multiples. And we were given the proportion who are multiples, it's 0 0.035, making single births 0.965. We're also told that the proportion of people who were um, single born, who are lefties, is 11%, uh, so 0.11 making 89% of us righties who are single-borns. The multiples actually have double the left proportions, 22 and 78. Is that because if you're a multiple, then you are uh, more similar to your uh, siblings? Who knows, possibly. What I would do here is I would multiply down each branch to find the probabilities of being single-born left-hand, single-born right-hand, multiple left-hand, multiple right-hand. So we get, if we multiply, uh, 0 0.10615, I went to five decimals because it terminates there, it didn't keep going. Uh, we have our single born righties at 0.8589, we have our multiples who are lefties, 0 0.0077, and multiples who are righties, 0 0.0273. What this tells us is that in the entire population, I have a 0 0.0077 chance of finding a multiple birth person who's a left-handed person. All right, so if I choose someone at random from the population, there's an 85.89% chance that person was a single-born person and right-handed. And this is going to help us answer all these problems. So um, part A basically says, what's the probability of finding a lefty? I already found the probabilities of finding a lefty who's, left, who's a single-born as well as a multiple. So the lefties are... 0 0.10615, who are from single borns, and 0 0.0077 from the multiples, and that gives me an answer of 0.11385. And because it was an easy question and, multi and, and um, free response, I would write just a very brief couple of words about it. Uh, there's a 11.385% chance of finding a person who's a lefty in the population. Okay. Part B asked us to find the probability of finding a multiple birth person given we found a lefty. So it's the probability of a multiple given the person is left-handed. I know the probability of finding a left-handed person. We just found it, 0.11385. I also know the probability of that person having been left-handed, which was 0 0.0033 from a multiple birth. So multiple birth given left-handedness is the 0 0.0077 divided by 0 0.11385 and that's 0 0.0676 and again in a few words given that i found a person who is left-handed there's a 6.76 percent chance that that person uh, is a multiple birth and finally part c shifts gears as it's wont to do and it says if i find 20 people at random from the population. What's the probability I find at least three who are left-handed? It's shifted immediately into being a binomial cumulative density problem. All right. We have our fixed value n, which is 20. We know the probability of finding a lefty from part A, 0.11385. We're looking for at least three successes, which is the right side of the binomial curve which means we're going to use the complement rule, one minus binomial CDF. Might as well write this down. One minus binom CDF, where n is 20, p is 0.11385, and x, well, for the complement rule, x is our biggest failing value. So what number is the biggest number that fails to be at least three? And that's going to give you the answer, which is 0 0.4021. 
there was a 40.21% chance of finding at least three lefties in our field of 20 people we drew. Again, be reasonable and logical. How many lefties do I expect to find? 11.385% of the 20 people. So I expect to find more than two. So there's a high probability of finding at least three. Makes sense. And that's all for number three. This was very handy. It didn't ask you to make the tree diagram, but it, it actually organizes all of our information and proves the values that we're using. So it acts as a uh, you know support for our answers in question three. Okay, and question four. Let's take that now. Um, question four was a hypothesis test. It said that we have um, a standard method and a new method, and uh, we want to see if um, the new method supports the conclusion that uh, we can say, do, 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 or it was uh, reducing, there were, it was uh, having to do with the ACL surgery and reducing the recovery time. Okay. You know that I like to organize things with a little table, so I'm going to say standard surgical procedure, not standard deviation, and the new surgical procedure. And for each of these procedures, I'm going to have a sample size, and we're given a mean, we're also given a standard deviation. The table was there for you, so I'm just kind of recreating it in order to serve my needs. It said that the, in the standard time, we had 110, I think, day recovery time. And I'm just, <laughs> that's very wrong. That's our sample size. 110 people were studied. And in the new group, 100 people were studied. Okay, cool. 217 days is the standard recovery time. But with the new procedure, it was 186. Obviously, that's a lot shorter recovery time, which is the, the point of the new procedure. And the standard deviation of the standard procedure was 34 days, but the standard deviation of the new procedure is 29 days, meaning it is less variable. So people heal much faster and more consistently. This is looking like the new procedure is doing what it's supposed to do. Let's just see if we want to keep reading. So we're, we're basically um, asked in part A, um, if everything works out, will this allow us to prove that we have uh, reduced the recovery time? Here's what I would write. Um, the conditions were verified, I wrote, because I verified the conditions first. Let's do that. That's why I have all this extra space. Conditions. We're, we're being asked to run a two-sample means difference test, if you hopefully can see that. So the first condition we always verified is randomization. It, it said they were randomly selected from people that actually qualified for the surgery. Obviously, we can't just pull a person off the street and operate on their ACL. It's people that need the surgery. It's, uh, it's a different environment when you have medical practices. They can't just all volunteer, uh, for, well, not even volunteer. We can't just pull it in when we want. It's gotta be from the population of people that qualify for and approve of having the surgery. Uh, what about the 10% rule? Well, if there's at least 1,100 people who require ACL surgery, and if there's at least 1,000 people that might've had the new surgery, we're good to go. Those are safe numbers. There's obviously going to be far more than a thousand people out there who need this type of surgery. It's a very common type of surgery. All right, now for means testing, we need to have either a normally distributed population. Do we? Well, I actually don't know. Unknown. Or you could just use an X. Unknown. I don't know if it's normal or not. So the second tier is checking that our sample size is sufficiently large, at least 30. Well, here we have it, 110, definitely more than 30, and 100 is definitely more than 30. So by organizing this information and checking our conditions, we're able to say for part A, the conditions are verified. So yes, if the data supports the conclusion, we can say that, as we can infer based upon the randomization element. If you have randomized uh, groupings. We, we, we took them randomly from 
the pool of people that needed the surgery, we randomly selected to who gets the standard and who gets the new. That act right there allows us to uh, generalize our inferences to the greater population. Conditions are all verified. We're good to go. Part B. Basically says, you know, test it, see what you got. We should begin by saying this is a two sample means difference test. Why do we do that? Because if we're identifying our test correctly, then obviously the steps we take can be checked against them being appropriate steps. So you do want to actually say what it is we're going to run. A two sample means difference test requires that I find the t-score for the difference. So I'm going to put that on paper. I hope you would as well because open-ended prompts score you based upon the support, the mathematical support, as well as the conclusions you draw from it. So the numerator of my t-score will be 217 minus 186 minus the expected difference, which in this case is going to be a zero when I actually think to write my statements, divided by the standard error, which is the square root of, we have 34 squared over its sample size, 110, plus the standard deviation of the second, 29 squared, over 100. Again, it's got to be x bar sub 1 minus x bar two, sub 2 minus mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 where relevant, divided by the square root of the variance over each sample size added together. Okay. While I'm here, I may as well um, finish it. The t-score for my particular sample difference is 7.1271. It wouldn't hurt at this point in your answer to say, wow, that's a huge t-score. We, we know the t-scores and z-scores are kind of similar. And a z-score that's that far away from center would be considered to be extremely significant. There's no difference here. It's going to be very significant. That's a huge value. And if I were to look at it as a sketch, which we always did in class, and here's my zero. That's a very not normal looking curve, but here's my zero. 7.1271. It's, it's way out here. Okay, that's my 7.1271. It's so far out to the right that the shading under it is almost invisible. I need my statements. What's my null and what's my alternate? Well, the null is that in this particular scenario, the mean difference was equal to zero. That was the null statement. There was no difference between the two procedures. What about my alternate? Now, am I looking for a greater than or am I looking for a less than? If the new procedure results in a shorter recovery time than the old procedure, the difference, taken in order, high number minus low number, is a positive number. So greater than zero, which is why I'm shading to the right, although it's hard to say I'm shading when it's that far away. There's really nothing to show. Uh, let's use an alpha level, a standard alpha of 5%, or if you want to say, hey, it's a medical procedure, it's more important. I don't want to make errors. I'm going to make my alpha 1%. You'll see in a moment why it doesn't matter at all. TCDF is the, how we find the area under the curve from 7.1271 to an infinite bound with how many degrees of freedom? Well, we said there were two methods. One was the crazy formula that the calculator will use, and you can feel free to do so if you'd like, or the conservative estimate, which we can always rely on and is appropriate, which is the smaller of the two sample sizes minus one. 100 minus 1 is 99. Now, this answer, I'm going to actually keep in scientific notation because of how small it is. 8.42 times 10 to the negative 11th power. That is a decimal point, 10 zeros, followed by 842. It's ridiculously small. That p-value is incredibly small. So it's lower, you could say the p-value is less than any alpha. And what do you do when the p-value is lower than alpha? You reject the null. 
Now I'm going to say what I would write because I don't have that much room. The evidence is extremely significant. It's very strong evidence that lets us say that we're going to reject the null, that there was no difference between the two procedures. We can say that there was a strong difference between the standard procedure and the new procedure, so strong that it is almost impossible to be due to random chance. The elements here, the results we see, they're due to the new procedure. That's the support. Okay. And that's all that number four asked you to do. So now your task, numbers five and six. Do your best. Put your all into it because, again, it's really all your actual exam is going to be. So see what we can score. Do our best. And I'll check in with you tomorrow.